thank you very much uh, for having me. <clears throat> I've spent um, 35 years uh, researching and writing about healthcare in the private sector, about nursing, patient safety, and teamwork, and six years writing and researching the VHA uh, and for this book, um, <clears throat> Wounds of War, which I hope you will all buy, because I'm a shameless peddler of my books. Um, and um, <clears throat> I spend a fair amount of time consulting um, in the VHA as well. And I'm, the VHA is the Veterans Health Administration. Um, and um, <clears throat> so really when we're talking about privatizing the VA, we're talking about privatizing the Veterans Health Administration, which is um, <clears throat> the largest healthcare system in the country. And I think privatization would be a disaster for veterans and a disaster for all Americans because the VHA doesn't just serve uh, veterans, it serves all of us. Um, <clears throat> I think that the VHA should be considered a model of how care could be delivered if we had a rational healthcare system in America. I think I'm a strong supporter of um, uh, some form of nationally supported healthcare system like exists in every other industrialized country except our own. Um, I think that actually uh, the slogan should be VA care for all, not Medicare for all, because the VA, Medicare is a payer, not a system, and the VA is a payer and a provider, which is why it has the outcomes that it has. Um, I think the VA, I've spent six years sitting in VA hospitals, uh, facilities, rehab hospitals, uh, blind rehab centers, PTSD programs, traumatic brain, I mean, you name it. Uh, it's a huge system, obviously, I couldn't be every, everywhere. It's got 1,700 sites of care, 170 medical centers. There's so many medical centers that the VA can't sometimes even keep track of how many medical centers there are. Um, and I think the models of teamwork, safety, quality, coordination, and integration of care are what we should all uh, experience in our healthcare and what we sadly um, don't. <coughs> and I think that if we do have a, uh, which I hope we will eventually get, I think if we ever do have some sort of Medicare for all single payer healthcare system where provision and insurance are, are joined, um, I think um, <clears throat> that the VA should be embedded in that system, not replaced by it. Because as long as we continue to have these terrible wars, which in my view are terribly misguided and unnecessary, um, and we keep producing all these uh, wounded warriors. And by the way, you don't have to be a wounded veteran to have, to, but to have you don't have to have been in combat to have been a wounded veteran. I mean, many veterans suffer all kinds of exposures just at never having left the continental United States. And we have to take care of those occupational injuries. Um, so I believe that we must have the VA be part of that system and we could eliminate a lot of the stupid eligibility requires that we, requirements uh, that pit veteran against veteran, citizen against citizen, and that uh, really uh, don't serve the needs of veterans or all Americans. I think that uh, after having experienced VA healthcare, not as a patient, but as an observer, I know, and I can say this with utter conviction, that I, who have the best health insurance in the country, uh, I can go anywhere I want, practically to anyone I want. I will never get the kind of care veterans get at the VA when it's at its best, because it just doesn't exist in the private sector healthcare system. Um, you have care at the VHA for patients who are cherry-picked because they are older, sicker, and poorer, right? The VA cannot take you as a patient if you are healthier and wealthier. You're not eligible. You're not in, in a top priority group. And they, have, they deliver this care, this integrated care, at a, at a much lower cost and at higher quality than is available in the private sector. I think that the VA's model of integrated coordinated care can only cannot exist in the private sector the way the private sector is currently constructed. Um, and that is because no matter how well intentioned its individual providers, um, it is the our private sector US healthcare system is profit driven, not mission driven. Um, <clears throat> 
It is, Lord, it is fragmented, not coordinated, and it's largely organized around the provision of disconnected episodic medical procedures and treatments. That's why we have the highest healthcare costs in the industrialized world, um, and why um, so many patients die from unnecessary uh, preventable medical errors and injury. I think that uh, the VA healthcare system, that one, some of the things you have to know about it are on these sheets, but it is fully integrated. It integrates mental health and primary health care. Uh, it has uh, one of the best uh, uh, electronic medical records in uh, the country, even in the world, which uh, is, try is about to be dismantled. Uh, it has systems of care, of primary care, of geriatric care, of palliative care, of end of life care, uh, of uh, mental, uh, mental health care. It is the nation's really only public health system because it deals with things like chronic homelessness, with education issues, with readjustment issues, and so forth. And it's delivered in a healthcare system that is veteran centric. Why? Because all it take care of are veterans. Uh, and veterans have very specific health care issues. They have more chronic pain, more suicidality, more mental and behavioral health uh, problems, more homelessness, etc., uh, than the average patient in the private sector. The average 65-year-old patient in the private sector has three to five um, comorbidities or presenting problems. The average Vietnam vet has nine to 12. When we consider the question of privatization, and make no mistake about it, under this current Mission Act that is being implemented now, the, the, uh, more and more care of veterans will be outsourced to the private sector, and that is um, uh, incremental privatization, even though the VA secretary denies that what they are doing is privatization. When we consider the question of privatization, of whether privatization is a good idea, those of you in the room who think it is a good idea, I implore you to think about several questions. One is, is the private sector capable of absorbing more than nine million complex veteran patients and serving their needs? Is it capable of delivering timely, high quality care? I believe that any reasonable analysis of the current conditions will lead people to say a resounding no. We have a serious problem in our country with primary shortages of primary care physicians. We need something like 45,000 more by 2030, and our medical schools and residency programs aren't, uh, aren't uh, producing them. 55% of all counties in the United States have no psychiatrist, psychologist, or social worker. Where are veterans going to get care in those counties, all of which are rural? 92 rural hospitals have closed in the last decade, and 700 are expected to close in the next decade. Where are veterans who live in rural areas, many of them do live in area, rural areas, going to get care? Uh, we have a horrible crisis of preventable medical injuries and errors. Can I read my last paragraph, or are you going to come One here? paragraph. Okay. So, I just want to quote from a VA report supporting the dangerous access standards being currently promulgated by the VA secretary and his Koch brother and industry funded advisors. The report states that VA wait times and care regularly outperform the private sector that, and that veterans prefer to get their care at the VHA. If this is the conclusion of proponents of outsourcing more and more veteran care to the private sector, of starving the VA of resources, of refusing to fill 40, 43,000 vacancies of the VHA, we have to ask what is going on. And I think the only logical answer to that question is that we are seeing the push for privatization of the VHA system, not improving and strengthening the system because of an anti-government, radical libertarian ideology driving this movement and because of the financial interests of some of the private sector healthcare industry that is interested in, cap in capturing the VA pot of gold. I believe our decisions need to be made on the needs of veterans and the rest of the patients like you and me that the VHA serves, and I don't think that is what, happen is, what is happening today. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. Jim. Thanks. Um, I too would uh, say I feel uh, very uh, privileged to be asked to be here tonight. Um, you know, I think the VA, there are many things about the VA that private sector could learn from. 
um, that could serve as an example for private sector healthcare. The quality in the VA, no matter kind of how you slice and dice and look at it, whether it's patient safety, the HEDIS metrics that people follow around prevention and chronic disease management, the VA is as good or better than private sector. And VA has done that for a long time, and private sector has actually caught up. Uh, parts of private sector have caught up with the VA's performance. And the VA does that, I would contend, at a lower cost structure than uh, Medicare, particularly when you kind of look at um, the population served by the VA versus Medicare and uh, kind of the difference in benefits uh, covered by the VA versus um, by Medicare. Um, and in general, commercial side of private sector health care is much more expensive than uh, Medicare. Um, VA focuses really, I think, um, outstandingly well on, pre on prevention um, and ambulatory services, uh, has um, extraordinary capabilities um, for mental health, which is usually sorely lacking in private sector, um, and uh, really, I think, coordinates care um, uh, across uh, the entire uh, continuum. And those are things I think that the VA does, um, does very, very well. And I think it does that in part because the economic incentives within the organization are really aligned. There's a culture of um, stewardship to manage affordability that exists within the organization. Um, they can negotiate drug prices, which private sector health care generally cannot do. Uh, particularly Medicare cannot do. Um, and, uh, and we really, the VA follows um, evidence-based medicine around formulary, supply chain management, and other things like that. And in, particularly, I think, in partnership with VBA can address some of the health determinants uh, of disease, homelessness, food insecurity, they have you know, job training and that, that kind of thing, addiction uh, therapy programs. So I think there is much that can be learned. I think uh, I often compare uh, the VA to Kaiser Permanente because they sh those two organizations uh, share a lot of DNA, I think, in common. There are things the VA doesn't do very well um, that I think private sector would be uh, foolish to try and uh, replicate. Um, you know, uh, if you looked at the kind of word salad that was up here at the beginning, it is big. Um, it can be anonymous and impersonal um, in many ways. Um, there uh, are a lot of regulations and rules that are hard for veterans to understand, and quite frankly, hard for staff to understand and deliver, uh, you know, explain those things in a consistent way um, across uh, the country. There's 350,000 employees um, in the Veterans Health Administration. Um, so I think um, there are some really good things that can be used as examples. But for me, there's a but at the end of all of that. Um, and, and the reality, I think, for the VA is that um, the veteran population, which is currently at about 20 million veterans in this country, um, is expected, the VA predicts, um, that that population will decline by about 30% over the next 15 to 16 years. Um, the uh, Vietnam War was really the last war that was fought with kind of full-time, uh, regular, active-duty military personnel. Since then, wars have been fought with guard troops. Particularly if you look at World War II, but even Vietnam, people came back and left the military and stayed uh, in places where they, they left, um, departed from military service. And so they were concentrated, particularly in cities like LA, Seattle, um, but today, those guard troops come back and they go back into every county in the United States. Um, and so, uh, you know, for that reason, um, uh, accessibility has become a major problem uh, over the last uh, 10, 10 to 15 years, uh, particularly for uh, the VA, uh, a geographical accessibility problem. And then there is a um, timeliness of access issue. And I think that um, I would contend, I work in private sector now, there are those same access issues in private sector. Um, if you uh, look at the appointment data, you can get an appointment today in the VA, pretty comparable to private sector. But there are delays uh, and access issues, I think, around acute care 
um, and around specialty care. So you might get the in to see your orthopedic surgeon for a, a visit um, in a timely way, but you might wait a long time to get your hip replacement done if it's an elective procedure. Um, so I think uh, the other point I would just make is if you look at the VA infrastructure, um, it's old. Um, some of the VA hospitals were built in the early 1900s. Um, the cost of building a new VA hospital in Denver was almost $2 billion. Um, I'll just tell you a short story in that when I was uh, working in central office, uh, we wanted to um, uh, centralize calls to call centers, much like Kaiser does uh, when you call a Kaiser clinic, you're actually talking to somebody in a call center to schedule an appointment or um, get a drug refill, et cetera. And uh, we had a contractor look at uh, helping us do that. And they came back and said, um, you have a problem because your phones are still on PBX systems, they're not digital. And I said, well, that's okay, well, what's it cost to fix that? Well, the answer is just to bring the phone systems in the VA up to digital standards would have cost $3 billion. I don't see American taxpayers investing uh, in the VA infrastructure um, to maintain that. Uh, and I think that um, uh, if you kind of marry all that up, declining veteran population, people in every county, uh, really aging infrastructure, that's not a formula for success in my mind. And I think that, uh, you know, I would say, I don't know that the VA is gonna be privatized. Uh, we could debate that, that's probably why we're here tonight. Um, but I would predict that the VA of the future is not going to be the VA of the past. Thank you. Great. <laughs> Kelly. Good evening. I have the great pleasure to speak this evening as a post 9-11 Iraq war veteran. And I hope my comments here do a service to my sisters and brothers, both in the audience and those from recent wars. I served from 2001 to 2011 as an army chaplain with time spent in the National Guard, in the reserves, on active duty. My veteran perspective is equally informed by my experiences as a patient here in Seattle at the Seattle VA. From my vantage point, the future of the VA is best answered by looking to the future of veterans themselves. In September of 2017, seven years after my deployment to Iraq, I was working at a local nonprofit not too far from here when the front office called me to sign for a delivery. When I arrived, I discovered that it was Joe, the delivery guy, someone I had known, bringing a tank of helium that the director had ordered so that we could blow up our own balloons for our monthly birthday celebrations. Joe then proceeded to explain how I needed to securely attach the tank to a concrete post just in case it tipped over and inadvertently became a projectile missile. Upon hearing this, I slowly began to walk away from Joe and the death trap that he had so cavalierly brought into the building. Noticing the color draining out of my face and my sudden stuttering of words, Joe offered to carry the helium tank himself to our basement storage area while I returned to my office, visibly shaken. By the grace of God, one of my colleagues noticed my distress and offered to be the point of contact for all future hel helium deliveries. For you see, helium tanks look quite a bit like an IED or a roadside bomb. But I was never hit by one, so I was surprised by my response. But the soldiers in my unit were, and the service members at the base hospital where I worked were and I buried some of them. Not all of us carry a debilitating fear of helium balloons, but we do carry depression and anxiety and chronic pain and worn out knees and embedded shrapnel and toxic poisons and immune system problems, mysterious cancers, addiction, guilt, disassociation, and sadness. Comprehensive veteran health care, therefore, is a no-brainer. But veterans do not exist in a bubble. They exist 
as members of families, and they have spouses and partners and children and parents and relatives and neighbors and friends and coworkers. And all of these people need to be healthy for veterans to be healthy. The individual tasks that we carry can range from tending to the physical and psychological implications of brain injuries. It, we have to tend to absent limbs from roadside bombs. We tend to PTSD from deathly encounters. And we tend to an inexcusable suicide rate. But there are other tasks, collective ones, that us veterans also manage in our daily lives, but they are not ours alone to carry. Some of us have a spidey sense that works over time and is extremely perceptive at picking up disturbances in the force, things that are out of place, behavior that doesn't fit. These veterans are the guardians of our public spaces. There are others of us who can no longer bury our heads in the sand pretending that the day-to-day -day decisions of ordinary civilians have nothing to do with the wars we wage overseas. These veterans are the guardians of our moral fiber. And still, for some of us, our experiences have carved canyons of sorrow so deep in our soul that it would take many lifetimes to grieve it all. These veterans are the guardians of life in a numb and distressed society. And these are some of the most important tasks that we can tackle, and every veteran I know is shouldering the weight of them in some kind of way. Which is why the question of privatization on the one hand and single payer on the other is best addressed by asking who exactly needs to be healthy. For society to be healthy, veterans need health care. For veterans to be healthy, the rest of society needs health care. Privatization has some similarities to contracting out, and we are 15 years into Middle East wars where we contracted out logistics, supply, food, water, security, and not to mention the other unsavory jobs that we paid to have done. And this is not a position, I would say, of integrity or honor. We should have three to four times the number of veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan that we do. And veteran health care is not like a cup of coffee or the purchase of a car or a mortgage on a home. Instead, it is a public good, more like roads and water and schools, things that need a high degree of integration and public support in order to work well. On the other hand, I'm also cautious about any endeavor which expands the federal government and I support a VA for all with both eyes open, understanding that due diligence and accountability are essential parts of the equation. I hung up my combat boots nine years ago. I packed my uniform away, and my salute is rusty. But the chaplain in me lives on, and my soldiers and their families need an integrated, streamlined system. I experienced this at the VA in ways that I did not experience it in the private sector. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, Steve. I, I'd also like to express my uh, thanks for being here. Um, in addition to the roles Aaron described uh, that I had in the VA, that is serving as a VA primary care physician for 36 years and uh, uh, directing uh, a research center for almost 20, um, I had the uh, for good fortune to have several other roles in VA. I directed a uh, primary care clinic and beginning in the days before it was actually legal to deliver primary care in the VA. Um, I served in central office as the chief quality and performance officer, uh, as the chief of uh, VA research, uh, and uh, my last job as the director of analytics and business intelligence. So I've had the opportunity to look at VA from a variety of perspectives. And I, in, as I answer this question about where the VA should go, I can't help but look back at the history of the organization. I think that's important to know. And, uh, complements the notion of, of looking forward. It's important to recognize that the government has provided health care to veterans directly following every war since the Revolutionary War. Uh, in the early years, this was um, largely custodial care. Uh, 
but following World War II, uh, the country made a commitment uh, to improve uh, its uh, care of veterans, um, and not only health care, but also, uh, as Jim mentioned, provision of education and financial security through loans and, and pensions. Uh, many, I think, have come to regard this as a covenant uh, between the, the country and uh, in exchange for those who devoted uh, years of their lives and often their lives themselves uh, uh, for the country. And, and to meet this challenge, uh, shortly following World War II, uh, General Omar Bradley uh, made a, uh, uh, in a two-page memo, a, an agreement with the medical schools of this country uh, to provide high-quality care to veterans in exchange for uh, educational opportunities um, to medical trainees. And for the next uh, four decades, uh, the VA system steadily uh, expanded and, and as you've heard uh, described already, um, to provide the best possible care uh, to, to veterans. And ultimately, uh, as you all know, the VA was converted into a cabinet department uh, in the 90s. Um, and since then, however, uh, as Jim alluded, has been relatively uh, static in, in terms of its, its size. Uh, like so many large federal programs, um, the VA has been a bit of an experiment. There was no uh, formula or example uh, preceding it. And, and I would submit to you that it's, as you've heard, been a, a very successful experiment. Uh, VA has furnished, uh, as we've heard, high quality care to tens of millions of veterans uh, over the last 70 years, provided training to well over a million health care professionals. Along the way, VA pioneered the electronic health record, supported Nobel, winning, uh, Nobel Prize winning research, and provided global leadership in caring for conditions like PTSD, hypertension, spinal cord injury, and uh, chronic medical conditions. And as also said, this has been accomplished at a net cost lower than it would have been uh, to have provided this service within the private sector. I think often forgotten and not mentioned is the fact that the VA has provided employment and a sense of purpose uh, to hundreds of thousands of Americans who actually work in the VA. Uh, I am one of those individuals. Uh, most certainly, and we could, I'm sure in discussion they'll come up, there have been stumbles uh, and deficiencies um, that have received vocal criticism. But overall, again, I think this has been a very successful uh, experiment and, and probably, arguably, as successful as any other large government program in this country. Uh, tens of thousands of lives have been improved uh, and many saved. Um, and many believe, uh, including I'm sure, as I gather from this audience, uh, that the VA has demonstrated how a federally funded, globally budgeted health care delivery system could work. Uh, but I share some of the concerns uh, that uh, Jim uh, Tuchmit has um, outlined. One, the demographics of a declining veteran population. Two, the outdated facilities with an average age approaching 60 years. Uh, and the maldistribution of those facilities, which mirrors where veterans lived 40 and 50 years ago when those facilities were built uh, and not where they live now. And complicated by the fact that the VA uh, promises to deliver um, health care services to every veteran uh, irrespective of where they reside. Um, no health insurance company would, would, would do that, and it's uh, difficult. Um, and those are three of the four big uh, obstacles I see uh, to, to VA. And the largest, which I'm surprised no one has mentioned so far, is the erratic and inconsistent management by both the executive and legislative branches uh, of our government, which I, I think is the most serious problem facing the VA. It's very difficult to operate perhaps the largest and most complicated health system in the nation in a highly politicized environment with uh, increasing and changing mandates and, and as Jim noted, very little flexibility or capability for long-term planning or budgeting. Based on these considerations, I had long um, expected that the VA would evolve over the next two to three decades, uh, probably shrinking to meet the changing needs of a diminishing number of veterans. Uh, at this point, however, 
uh, such a sen uh, sensible and gradual glide path seems unlikely to me, if not impossible, as essential resources are being shoveled out of the system faster than the systems can uh, to track and manage them can be constructed. Um, my expectation at this point is that veterans will likely be confused and disappointed when they experience uh, difficulties in obtaining prompt and high quality services in the private sector uh, that do not conform to their expectations. And simultaneously, an underfunded VA system will be forced to continually reduce services. I do believe that VA has demonstrated that a globally budgeted national health care system can function effectively, as we've heard. Um, but what I think I have also learned is that unless it's insulated from the ever-changing political whims, it would be difficult, if not impossible, to operate efficiency, efficiently and effectively. Even the National Health Service in, in Britain, which has operated as a national trust, has had difficulty with um, politics interfering with the delivery of care. On the other hand, I think the complete or near complete privatization of the VA is apt to cost more and disappoint veterans, which has largely been the experience with TRICARE, which is the example uh, for that. Um, DO and DOD has far more resources and experience in operating a health plan um, than the VA. So um, my hope is that again, we'll reach the sort of happy um, sort of evolution that uh, Dr. Tuchschmidt um, outlined for us, but I'm, I'm s somewhat pessimistic that we'll be able to do that, but perhaps um, I'll be wrong. <clears throat> Thank you. Hugh? I would mirror and reflect a lot of the statements that have been made. Um, long story short, I'll begin at the end, and I think the VA should be maintained. I think underfunding uh, is an issue that is at the whim of really reactionary politics, like many other things in our society. <clears throat> and we have to decide as a society and an electorate Really, if we feel that health care is a human right, or is it a privilege only afforded to those who can pay? Even if you can pay at a top shelf insurance, if you fall ill, you lose your job, you lose your job in, or employee supported health care, and then you will become indigent, as been shown in several studies by the Harvard School of Public Health. 51% of American bank personal bankruptcy is filed because of health care expenditures. Of the people who filed for bankruptcy, 75% of them had health care coverage when they fell ill. So we are all at the whim and at a pink slip's mercy in this paper universe, as the old song goes, to our good <laughs> luck and subsequent good health. So there's a lot of things. Uh, so I'm a health educator. I'm a general surgeon. I work at Harborview. I've been there continuously since 1991. Uh, I was a student at the VA uh, during medical school. I worked at the VA as a resident. And so I see that from that perspective and also for the perspective down the street at what is probably one of the last remaining other vestiges of public health institutions in our, in, our, uh, in our city, which is Harborview. And I can tell you that I think the VA is very well organized, as Suzanne has pointed out very well in her book. And I would, if you haven't read it, I would highly recommend it. It is truly an in-depth analysis of the VA and all that it has done in terms of its not just delivery of care, both inpatient and outpatient, but more importantly, to the growing need of the psychosocial aspects of health care, particularly PTSD and other things. I can take somebody's gallbladder out. My colleague can bypass their blocked artery, but the tough work and the heavy lifting is taking care of people with PTSD, addiction, and other emotional issues. And I don't know about any of you, but even those of us with top shelf health insurance who have tried to access mental health care, it's nearly impossible. 
nearly impossible if you have private insurance until your crisis escalates to a police activity. Try it sometime. I hope you don't have to. I have had to for family members and friends. So one of the best things that the VA does is comprehensive and very thorough analysis and treatment of people with these kind of social determinants of health, particularly psychosocial aspects. It is comprehensive both medically, socially, and I would argue geographically as well. I come from the flyover zone. I grew up in the tri-state area of Nebraska, as my New Jersey roommate described it as he drove with me, the sticks of the sticks. Yes, it is difficult to access healthcare due to vast geographic differences, but one of the things VA does well, and they did it well when I was a medical student in Omaha in 1976, is telehealth and teleeducation. And I think that's one of the great uh, prospects that it can be developed not ignored and allowed to wither on the vine. It fulfills this uh, important social need and it fulfills that promise to people who have served and now in this continuous war of nearly 30 years. Never before in our country's history have we had a situation like this. Yes, they come back, they're different than World War II veterans. They're, they're different than perhaps the Vietnam veterans who saw enormous amounts of carnage. But still the psychosocial aspects of what they come back and the burdens that they bear are incredible and need attention as well. The VA is also very innovative. Innovative in their development of the first and probably still best comprehensive electronic medical records, which really helps bind together a complex and diffuse healthcare system. Particularly in a teaching environment, it's, what, it's the glue that helps hold us together and helps us de deliver really quality care where we have not just a record but an x-ray at a fingertips reach. I can look at a CT scan and scroll through it with one millimeter resolution while I lay on my back in the sunshine and in my backyard wireless. The VA developed the best EMR. They did it decades before anybody else and they did it for a fraction of cost because it was open source and it was not for profit and it wasn't a proprietary silo. So the VA has done a lot of things in terms of innovation. And if you want to look at the inflection of healthcare costs, much of it is buried in the cost of proprietary competitive electronic medical records, which I think is responsible for a huge part of the inflection curve of the cost. We paid X amount of dollars uh, for a, a comprehensive EMR. It took us 10X and 10 years to implement it. We thought we bought a Lexus we could drive off the lot. Turned out it was crates of car parts used Toyota car parts, to quote a former director of our institution. So I could go on at the innovation, but I think the VA should be maintained. It should be continued. It should be funded. Our, we, we can't even fund public education in our state, let alone fund health care in this nation. But we've got to decide as an electorate, is health care a right? Or is it a privilege of the ever shrinking ability, not just of those of us who have employee based health insurance, but now it's to the point where you have to be wealthy. I mean, your, your, your uh, job insurance won't even cover psychiatric visits in the private sector and you won't even get a visit with a private psychiatrist for at least three weeks. So I think the VA should be maintained it should be improved. Their systems of care and the dedication should be held as a model as we evolve from our fractured for-profit health insurance environment to a single-payer environment like they have in Canada. I don't think we should have a delivery system like the National Health Service in the United Kingdom, that's perhaps, and believe it or not, I can't believe I'm actually more moderate in that respect. I think we could keep our system of providers like Canada does, but we need to have a single payer mechanism and we need universal access. One of the advantages of the VA is when their demand expands, they're the only one in the whole country who can contract their eligibility 
and the supply of patients. I don't have that luxury at Harborview. Tonight there are 56 patients in a 400 bed hospital at Harborview who do not have a bed. 56 inpatients. And that's every night for 15 years. So I think keep the VA, make it a model, and we need a single payer uh, mechanism for the financing and we have to decide as an electorate, is it a right or is it a privilege of the 1%? Thank you. So um, I sense a troubling level of consensus among the, <laughs> the panelists, um, but I'm going to try to provoke um, maybe some, some, some lines of thought that um, we might explore. Um, and I'm going to start off, actually, I'm just going to throw this out to whoever wants to respond to it. This morning I heard a story on our local, our local NPR station about the opening of a a new free clinic for veterans down in Lakewood near, near Olympia, down towards Olympia, um, that was funded by Stephen Cohen, who's a <laughs> philanthropist, and he's apparently putting $275 million into these clinics, about 25 clinics around the country. And this is the, 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 the clinic is to support post 9-11 veterans and military families with mental health services regardless of veterans' discharge status or ability to pay, to pay, the first clinic of its kind in the state. Now, it reminds me a little bit, we have free, we have free clinics that serve disenfranchised people in the general population. Uh, uh, those exist, uh, I, I would say, in many communities around the country. So the need to create a clinic to serve post 9-11 veterans and provide them particularly with mental health care. What does that say about the current state of the, the VA? I mean, it sounds like a big hole. Suzanne. Well, um, I would refer people to an article Jasper Craven and I did in The Nation on Stephen Cohen, who actually is, I wouldn't describe Stephen Cohen as a philanthropist. He is actually one of the most notorious hedge fund managers in the country. He was om almost narrowly indicted. Um, <clears throat> and sent to jail for insider trading. Um, and I think the Cone Veteran Networks are a, a problem and a symptom. Um, one of the things Cohen Veteran Networks do is, um, <clears throat> and by the way, the 270 million, five million that he funded um, uh, these clinics with for five years, he could actually fund them for the rest of his life because he has something like $14 billion. Um, and it would represent very little. But uh, one of the, uh, and that is precisely the amount of money that was the insider trading scandal. Um, but um, Okay, but what about the clinics? Well, I think that, you know, I think the, clini the clinics um, have, um, uh, I think they, they are, as I said, a symptom um, of the fact that um, a lot of, uh, of the of VA is underfunded and understaffed, and also that because Congress won't change this crazy uh, rule about not letting veterans with other than honorable discharge is uh, be cared for by the VA, except for now there's an order that they get 90 days of mental health care, which is not enough, and they haven't added, added extra staff to do it. I mean, I, I see this as, as both as sort of a problem and as a failure of the society to, you know, significant, adequately fund the VA. I mean, another problem with Cone's, the Cone Network is that all of his clinics are, uh, he said he was going to serve underserved areas, yet all of his clinics are being uh, opened in places like Seattle where there are already VA clinics. So there are a lot of people that are concerned that he's actually trying to set up a competitive healthcare system uh, with the VA. I mean, I think some of the people in on this panel have pointed to the issue that, um, you know, part of the problem is that the VA is underfunded and understaffed. We have 43,000 vacancies in the VA. And the secretary has said in two hearings recently that he will not fill them. Um, so you are sort of, I think, setting up 
you know, the VA for failure. It's like the underfunding the, the public schools. And, um, you know, making inevitable uh, that people, some with good intentions and some with not so good intentions, so, will be uh, exploiting uh, the, the taxpayer's dollar. Thanks. Jim, you have... You have yeah, I was just going to say, so, you know, Kelly hung up her boots, but um, the one thing uh, that is... Um, uh, pretty common is so many of the the guard folks come back uh, from being from a deployment and uh, and put on their civilian clothes, but they're still in the guard and they still want to go back. They still have a military career, and um, and many of them are very reluctant to come into the VA uh, and um, and talk about uh, PTSD or have mental health issues or have military sexual trauma um, because of a fear that that will end up getting into their record and affect their ability to be promoted or even stay in the military. So there is, um, you know, it is a, uh, a big issue. It is particularly a big issue with women who suffer military sexual trauma. And I think it's something that the VA has been trying to address, um, but it's, uh, it is a challenging situation. Steve. So, yeah, I, w I would agree what was said. And, I, you know, uh, although I, I do find it odd that it's being placed, you know, right next Lately. to a military uh, hospital and a, and a VA, um, a large VA clinic, um, you know, the one thing that you said, and I hadn't read about this, that, that would be an advantage from my perspective is the opportunity to take care of families. Um, you know, one of the difficulties in the VA is that we can only take care of veterans, and there's been talk over the years of expanding eligibility to family members, and I, I think that would be an, an excellent um, uh, improvement to, to the VA to expand that eligibility. Uh, I would also say that, you know, in addition to sort of um, directly starving the VA for resources, one of the big shackles that's been applied is the inability to close uh, underused facilities. So these older facilities that don't have, uh, you know, where resources could be transferred to those areas where uh, there is high demand and increasing enrollment in the VA uh, is practically impossible. And, and for those who, you know, really want to know what happened in Phoenix, that's actually what happened. That was the area of the country with the highest growth of new veteran enrollees and your budget's based on your activity from three years ago. So it's impossible really to respond promptly to those surges. So, um, you know, I think in addition to, you know, sort of, you know, fully funding um, and not um, sending money out the door to have given VA leadership the opportunity, which they haven't had for, you know, 30 years, just like closing a military base, uh, only harder. Um, to, to sort of be able to adjust to the changing demographics and changing needs. Kelly and then Hugh. For the clinic that you mentioned, one of the interesting pieces about it that you mentioned was the role of discharge and one's discharge mm -hmm. status and the, the ways that that affects how much health care you're, you're eligible for and how much you are not. And it plays into this idea that we earn our health care, that, that some are more deserving than others. And I think there do need to be some things in life and in society that we do earn. Um, but I don't look at my children and think, well, which ones of you have earned your health care for this week and which ones of you haven't? <laughs> like, I mean, I think in day-to-day -day life, it just doesn't work like that. We, I don't think we actually think in terms of earning or privilege, like rights or privileges. We just think the communities around us need to be healthy for us to be healthy. Our families need to be healthy for us to be healthy. The dishonorable discharge veteran needs to be healthy in order for me to be healthy. So, so I think it, it, it's, it's maybe tapping into sort of this, this piece that is kind of unanswered, or, or it's not answered fully or adequately enough um, around the role of discharge. Mm. I have a colleague who was dishonorably discharged for drug use and then has struggled to have, have a job. So he has no health care. And so he has absolutely no way to get help for his addiction problems. And right like that begins to bypass whether you have the right to it or whether you've earned it or not. That just has the role of do you have access to health or do you not? You? I, I would just um, 
echo what Kelly said about eligibility. Eligibility, again, is that, uh, that fluctuating gatekeeper mechanism that the VA is so good at. There are, what, eight, more than eight categories? Eight. Uh, there, if you're a Gulf War vet, you get it free for five years. If you're a Purple Heart recipient, right, you were wounded in action, you get it. If you were uh, uh, dis discharged with a disability, you can get it, and there's various ratings on the percentage. If you're a Southwest Asia Gulf War veteran, uh, you know, Afghanistan, et cetera, from 90 to 98, if you had discharged with a VA service disability, if you're in Vietnam from 62 to 70, May 75, you get it. If you had head and neck radiation treatment, you can get it. If you were at Camp Lejeune during a certain period where their water was actually horribly poisoned, which my brother, a veteran of 26 years, tells me that the funding for the wall will take the money not to halt the Camp Lejeune water contamination, echoing our problems in Flint, Michigan. So that ability to fluctuate this incredibly labyrinthine eligibility requirements is, is, of course, very complex. In terms of being able to take care of aging facilities, I went to medical school and I went out to a rural clinic back in 19... Uh, 70s, where back in those days, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, when they saw a need, they went out and they set up trailers. They set up trailers in the Central Valley of California. They set up trailers in, uh, in the Yakima Valley here. And they expanded to meet fluctuating needs, not with, you know, super expensive, many billion dollar facilities, but with sometimes temporary, because hopefully the need will fluctuate if we can ever turn off this continuous war. Okay, um, solve that problem. Um, <laughs> no, those are good. I mean, this is, yeah, it's kind of uh, fascinating. Let me let me um, uh, probe on this. So, um, Steve, I think you 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 mentioned how you know the base closure thing and how it's like impossible to close a, a military base. You know, communities and their political leaders rally around and say, no, this is. This one's necessary, close somebody else's. And actually healthcare, just in general, forget about the VA, healthcare in general is also uh, subject to the same sort of parochialism. Um, it's very hard for public officials to close uh, rural hospitals, for example. So what they do is they, of course, turn to the private sector and they allow, you know, uh, it, you know management companies to, to take over the hospitals and then, and then close them down. But you all, you sort of all mentioned the fact that, um, you know, the needs of veterans uh, has changed, will be changing. Um, maybe the population will be shrinking. Uh, I don't have a lot of confidence in that, given our propensity to go to war. Um, and so what ideas do you have for, for how to keep um, a, a health system nimble enough to provide adequate care when you can't really do that through bricks and mortar itself or only. You've got to figure out some other ways. So the Choice you know, Act was an attempt to provide some nimbleness, and I, I guess you know, somebody thought the, the, what's the next one? The Mission, Mission Act. Act was. But, but, but the point, for, sort of set, set aside those political uh, uh, hot potatoes. What, what ideas do you have that would actually allow a system as complex and large as the VA to, to be nimble enough to, to serve people who need to be served adequately? Do you want us to go the same no, way? No, I just want somebody to answer. We, have, we only have about five minutes. Well, I think that, um, you know, there have been propositions um, in like there was a commission on care mandated by the um, the Choice Act, where uh, the commission came up with the idea of doing some pilot programs um, where you would use underutilized um, facilities to care for families of veterans. Um, I agree completely with Kelly, um, although I do think families of veterans do benefit. Um, from VA care in ways that we don't see. Um, but I think that they, uh, you could create pilot programs in underutilized facilities um, where uh, you 
Uh, are you talking oh. about underutilized private facilities like no VA, VA facilities. I mean if we okay. have a problem with under with with under okay. utilization and by the way I, I really think you know there are a lot of assumptions here and you raised one Aaron that that we are going to have a dwindling you know veteran population how do we know that I mean you know given our country's propensity to jump into conflict and also as I think anybody who's a physician on this panel and anybody who's a caregiver in the audience knows you can have a dwindling population that has higher needs mm. you know I mean the veterans of today uh, have way more problems because of our amazing uh, ability to triage on the battlefield I mean people who would have died in Vietnam or World War II or Korea live today with horrendous chronic problems so um, you know I, I also think so I think that there can be experiments with um, sir, you know with adding families and even um, you know we're all, even uh, uh, non veteran patients why not I mean you know but I mean there's also telehealth um, et cetera, et cetera. I just want to raise one question because we've all talked about you know giving uh, the right to care to all Americans. I think one of the fundamental unanswered things that this country hasn't dealt with is actually calculating the real cost of war, right? And the real cost of war includes like right. a very well-funded as opposed to underfunded VA. And we have refused to do that as a country. Okay, uh, Steve? So I, I think, you know, um, the VA, and, and Hugh kind of mentioned that, what it actually has done historically quite well is innovate. Um, and, and I think the opportunities to innovate have been withheld from the organization uh, for a couple of decades. Um, you know, it's still, I think, there and could be unleashed. Um, you know, one of my great disappointments is with the new ER, EHR is that VA is not allowed, is not being permitted to bring the innovation to it which needs to happen. Um, you know, one great innovation I thought that uh, Jim will know about that was planned was actually not to build a hospital in Denver. The original plan actually was to lease um, hospital space from the, the new Anschutz uh, Medical Center, which was built uh, down the street, uh, so the VA could have flexible hospital space, could share laboratory and radiology facilities, and then be able to flex up and down. Um, you know, the VA pioneered in building these super clinics. There is one in, in Ohio where, you know, it's, it, it's got all but inpatient beds. And, and VA may not necessarily need to be in the inpatient uh, business in some communities. There's also been a lot of talk about figuring out what the VA does well um, and what actually would be better provided in, in some other settings and give local VAs the opportunity to sort of make those decisions and, and have some flexibility. Um, so I mean, and I think as Hugh said, the, the informatics, the telehealth, uh, the scan echo programs, um, the, you know, all the informatics advances. To me, actually, that's what the VA could do. That's the leadership that the VA could provide just as it had before in sort of being able to experiment without the same financial risk as private health care systems. And uh, I, I, I think it, there could be lots of improvements. You, you, again, I'm very short. Very Jim? short. No, oh. Jim and then you. Oh. Really short. Go ahead. Okay. You and then Jim. Um, at uh, Deception Pass State Park, there's a museum to the Civilian Conservation Corps. Mm. It takes political will and leadership. 300,000 young men in this country were put to work in the course of less than six months in the CCC. And so, can we be nimble? We have been nimble. We just have to be nimble again. Yeah, yeah I was word. just going to say, you know, I think that uh, um, I have a lot of confidence actually in the projections around the veteran population. We just, we don't fight wars the way we did in World War II and Vietnam. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, on the front of the VA building in Washington, D.C. is the mission statement for the Department of Veterans Affairs, handed down by Abraham Lincoln. And it sounds a bit sexist today, but you know, it was Abraham Lincoln, um, <laughs> which is, you know, to care for he who bore the battle for his widow and his orphan. That's the mission of the VA. 
it's not about the brick and mortar that sits on uh, the hill down, down the road. Um, it's, about, it's about that mission, right? It's about taking care of Kelly and her uh, brothers and sisters. Um, and I think that uh, VA going forward is going to have to partner with private sector to be able to do this. I, I just, you know, uh, uh, Steve said it, the buildings are not in the right places anymore. Um, I uh, uh, was on a group in Oregon um, going around and looking uh, and doing town hall meetings around the state uh, um, to talk about how things could be improved as people left the guard. And I, and I met this young man in, out in Pendleton, Oregon, who had his leg blown off by an RPG. And um, he wanted to know why he couldn't text message his doctor uh, and get help, uh, and why he had to go to Portland uh, to get a new prosthesis. Uh, and it wasn't so he could walk around, it was so he could snowboard. Um, I think the expectations of a new generation of veterans are just very different, and I don't think uh, VA is gonna be able to do it by trying to sustain the organization that it has today. Okay, thanks for those comments. Um, now it's your turn. So we have about a little over half an hour for your questions. Um, here's how it's gonna work. Uh, Molly and James have uh, uh, mobile mics. Um, so raise your hand if you have a question. Be patient for them to come around. They are not gonna give up control of that mic. <laughs> So I, lear I learned this from Denny Heck, who's a congressman from, from Olympia, but uh, he used to, when, when, he, uh, when he ran TVW, which is our public access TV, um, he moderated a lot of uh, panels that I was on. And he walked around a room and he held on to that mic. And he didn't give up control of that mic. So that's what James and Molly are gonna do. You have an opportunity to ask a question. So be thoughtful about how to frame that question succinctly. If you start running on, making a statement, I will cut you off and they will take the mic away. <laughs> okay, fair enough? Yes. All right, so who's got a question? He's tough. Oh, McClanahan. <laughs> Anyways, they're, 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 gonna, they're gonna find you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Medicare for all is in the wind, and Bernie Sanders' bill and Pramila Jayapal's bill do not integrate the VA system or the Indian health system right away, but they, I think, make allusions to this can be done in the future. Is this something that you see happening in the future, that the VA facilities such as we have on Beacon Hill will become part of the Medicare for all system as a a hospital where anybody can go to? Do you see that the veterans are so special that they need something that's totally separated from a fabulous Medicare for all system? Okay, who would like to respond? Well, th that, that's a you know, debate in and of itself, and, and I'm not sure what's meant by Medicare for all. Um, I think Jim's right. It, you know, there are things the VA can do that aren't done well in the private sector and vice versa, and integration would be important. One of the, you know, things that was floated in the Obama administration was con consolidation of all the federal health care facilities, IHS, VA, DOD, um, HHS facilities, and creation of a federal health system, hmm. which might be an, an intervening step to integrating more with the, with the private sector. I, I'd be curious to what other people think. I'll answer the question about the specialness of veterans. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're, we're a very special group. The, the answer I would say is both yes and no. There, I would say there are, um, there are some complexities and some nuances that are unique to veterans and so they do need some targeted kinds of care in that sense. Um, on the other hand, everybody needs a primary care provider. Um, so there, there are some ways that, that it's, th there's, there's the basics. The basics kind of don't necessarily change depending on who you are. Um, and this sort of ties into the previous question about the nimbleness. And if we, if we plan for, take me for example, like 
if we plan the fact that I'm going to need a primary care provider based on the fact that I was born instead of based on my veteran status, then it, it decreases the need for the VA, VA to be so nimble in the first place. Mm. Because the planning is long range instead of waiting for 9-11 to happen or waiting to see how well I integrate or don't integrate when I come back from my deployment. So, so I think there's, I, I think it's a, it's a yes and a no. Mm. So I think, you know, uh, Steve alluded to this uh, um, earlier in his opening comments and I think um, the one thing that would allow the physical footprint of the VA to uh, probably um, uh, last longer than it otherwise might uh, is if those facilities could care for families of veterans that, that a, a spouse could take their Medicaid uh, or Medicare benefits and go to that facility or their commercial insurance and go to that facility um, if potentially other people in the community you know it would be um, uh, kind of a alternative revenue stream that would help support those facilities um, in communities uh, you know, I mean, I think Seattle has enough uh, population that, it, that the Seattle VA is probably secure for years and years to come. But in smaller communities, um, you know, I think allowing facilities uh, to extend the population they're serving uh, probably would help preserve those places and also preserve some of the unique services that they can, they and only they can provide veterans. Yeah, I just want to add one other thing, is that actually veterans have been having choice for a very long time, right? When they turn 65, they get the choice to take Medicare. The number of veterans going to the VA has actually increased, not decreased, um, which I, I think says something about, um, you know, how people might be voting with their feet. Um, I'd like to respond to that question. Um, when I started writing about um, VA health care, I didn't know that much about veterans and one of the things that over the past 10 years I've been really impressed by is how different veteran problems are from, you know, the from the average person who isn't a veteran. Now, you know, and the, the people who are, who go to the VA, and I believe, actually, I believe that under a Medicare, whatever we want to call it, Medicare for all system, um, <clears throat> you would do away with the eligibility requirements. So anybody who's a veteran could go to the VA. And they also don't, wouldn't have to go to the VA. You know, they, they could go anywhere, right? And I mean, um, but I think that what has really impressed me about hanging around veterans' hospitals is veterans have very, I mean, we talk about population health, right? And veterans are a very particular population. I mean, they have more problems, and I have been impressed and depressed by some stories about the inadequacy of the private sector to even recognize those problems. I've been a patient for, well, since I was able to, you know, let's say since I was 18, I've been, I'm 73, nobody's ever asked me if I was in the service. Nobody's ever asked my husband if he was in the service. How do they know, right? Uh, I have a friend who's a Vietnam veteran who, very typical story, you know, had PH, PTSD, went to the VA, got better, had a very strong career in the private sector, had private sector health care, retired, guess what, it came back, it, it often does, when people have a lot of time on their hands, goes to his PCP in the private sector and complains of insomnia and nightmares and is given Ambien, you know, and I mean, he didn't even know he was a veteran. I mean, I'm not a doctor, I could have diagnosed PTSD. So I do think that there are very specific problems that veterans have and that they, you know, need people who are well versed in those problems. And I think you're right, you're all right. We have to have private public partnerships, but these pro partnerships have to be real partnerships. You know, they can't be taking money uh, from the VA to enrich the private sector. Um, <clears throat> and I think that that is something that's extremely important for us to, to, to keep in mind. Great, thanks. Yeah. Next question. I won't touch the mic. So my question <laughs> revolves around the Department of Defense and the Defense Health Agency that I know is standing up is, and I think you touched on it briefly, is there any plans to look at uh, joint DHA, VA, um, use of facilities, skills, so that 
because there is problems within the Department of Defense in terms of skilled degradation in certain areas where they don't get to practice enough for like general surgery and trauma. So is there any <coughs> crosstalk going to, between the two? Jim, you're probably. I don't know. Okay. It's based on a political football. Oh, hi. Um, hey, I'll let you have that mic. Yeah. Um, so the answer is yes. Um, it is very dependent on the political football, and it's very dependent on fixed facility costs, which is why it's very interesting what you're bringing up about um, joining the uh, beneficiaries populations within the locale. I do agree that would reduce fixed facility costs, and also just like you're saying, cost sharing. Um, so cur currently, sorry, MOU um, locally to do that exact thing, but it does depend on that local VA leadership to sort of engage at that level. But long-term planning, absolutely DHA is interested in that. Um, Thank you. Thank you. There are, oh. Oh. I was gonna say, there are a few places around the country where VA and DOD have joint facilities uh, in uh, Hawaii and Alaska um, and a few other places in the country. And I think there's, you know, there are economies of scale that come about from those relationships. Okay. All right, another? Oh. And in terms of, there is cooperation too between uh, private or university hospitals and the DOD in terms of training, mm -hmm. both of residents and also reciprocal relationship where, at least in my field of trauma surgery, uh, trauma surgeons will go visit in actually not in the frontline theater, but actually places like Longstool and uh, other bases around quaternary centers in the country to help lend expertise. Uh, times of peace, we train army residents. Uh, time of war, they train us. And it's just, a, it's a give and take phenomenon. And there's also partnerships um, in between the DOD and the VA in rehab, uh, mm. because the Department of Defense hospitals don't do rehab, so polytrauma, for example, is mm. filled with active duty service members who might have gotten in motor vehicle accidents and so forth. I mean, most people aren't aware of, I think, those kind of partnerships. Thank you. Okay, another question. David, um, this question is mostly for Kelly, but my, my question is, is that, especially in my work, I, I'm a caseworker and I do outreach for, congressional, uh, for Congresswoman Jayapal, and what I've noticed, especially amongst the 20-something and 30-something veterans, is that a lot of them don't even go to the VA, um, and I think a lot of that is because of reputation. Uh, you have other vets who might have had a negative experience, and if I know anything about government, you're gonna remember what we do wrong more than you're gonna remember what we do right. That just is a fact of life. Um, so my question to you is, how, how, if we're gonna have the VA continue to be successful in the future, how do we make the VA appealing to people of your generation, um, and how, how do we make the VA more accessible to young folks because the VA is still very much geared towards the Vietnam era veterans and it's like you're speaking a different language um, because the only way you're going to get to veterans and I know it sounds silly is you know Instagram or on social media or other things because that's where they are but the VA and our government just hasn't caught up to them yet and it's part of why I think the suicide rates are so horrifying and they're only climbing, especially amongst women veterans as well. The VA is a mysterious beast and, and I was one of those 30-somethings who, no longer a 30-something, but who was going to never set foot in the VA, like I would rather would have died than have gone there. And, and it almost came to that. Um, but I, I think the issue, I, I'm not sure Instagram is like the solution. I, I, think, I think part of the challenge is collective wisdom. And so we have a very small number of veterans. There's not that many. And there's a lot of, I think, ethical and moral reasons for that. Some of them not very good because we, we just contracted out a lot of our war. And we should have more veterans. But there's not that many. And especially if you're a guard and reservist, and I was, a, I was in the guard, you return back and you're not necessarily surrounded by folks who have know-how around the healthcare systems. Like, I'm, even to this day, I, my base community knows nothing about the VA. Mm. 
Mm. So, so there's no collective wisdom like, oh, go see so-and-so. Oh, this is the form you fill out. And you go to office number 14, and that's where you get it. And then you fill it out. Like, I just, I found my, I really stumbled my way in and then began to figure it out only because I had no other health care. That was, it was trial by fire. Um, but I don't think I'm unique, especially being a garden reserve person. You return back to a community that doesn't necessarily have anyone around you who can just give you those basics like, oh, this is how it works. Oh, this is what you do. You just walk in the door. Like, I mean, people say, oh, just go visit the VA and sign up. And you're like, well, what actually does that mean? Where, where do I go? And what office do I go to? And who do I talk to? And how do I sign up? And are they just going to say, oh, you're not eligible? I mean, just there's a, lot of, there's a lot of pieces to it. And so I think, I do think everyone has their responsibilities. And the VA does have its, its fair share of responsibilities for needing to reach out and get the message out. But I also think there's, there's a challenge there that, that if, you're, if you're only one in your community and there's no one else, how are you ever going to learn about what the VA has? I have a colleague here, Mike, from Veterans for Peace, and him and I had a conversation a month ago because I was complaining. I was saying, boy, I really wish the VA had eye care, like vision care. The VA does. <laughs> yeah. And Mike said, they have vision care. And I said, oh, well, they really shouldn't like hide it and just put it <laughs> in a place in the building that no one can find it. So at which point he explained, it's just to the right off of the front entrance, yeah. right? So right. I've been part of the VA for years, but, but didn't know that it was right there and available all the time because, because my neighbor doesn't go to the VA and my other neighbor who has vision care can't say to me, oh yeah, it's just right off the right. I have to wait till I encounter Mike at our Veterans for Peace meetings to find out that there's vision care. So th that's a long answer perhaps. Can I just say something about this? Because I think this is a really important issue that people have to understand. I mean, I don't know how many people, we printed this fact sheet here. Because, I mean, this is probably an extremely educated audience, right? But we felt that the people who organized this and, and the participants felt that a lot of people, you know, the VA is the biggest healthcare system in the country, and a lot of people have seen the sign VA hospital and haven't got a clue what goes on. I just spoke to two people today who are in healthcare and thought Walter Reed was a VA hospital. Hmm. These are educated healthcare professionals. Walter Reed is an army hospital, right? So, you know, part of the problem is that um, we are completely ignorant of, of the VA, most Americans. I was one of those Americans. The VA is not allowed to market and advertise. They have a hugely restricted advertising and marketing budget and you have to go through a million hoops. The average VA, large VA hospital, has two public affairs officers, whereas a place like UW, God knows how many there are, a hundred? I mean, you know, the average 200-bed hospital spends a million dollars on advertising a year. Do they need to do that? Probably no. Does the VA need to do that? Probably yes. You know, so there's a lot of, I mean, you know, Congress... I, I think I recommended to the Congressperson Jayapal that you know somebody in Congress has to remedy this situation of the way the VA is asked is being asked to compete with the private sector with its hands tied behind its back and its feet in shackles. You know, I mean, it cannot get the word out because it is understaffed and underfunded in that regard in the getting the word out. You. Um. Grassroots organizations, Veterans for Peace, uh, the, your local VFW. My brother is a Vietnam veteran and uh, retired after 26 years of service in the reserves and the guard. In his rural community at the VFW, v he and his uh, fellow Vietnam veterans and others have uh, group ther therapy, group sessions, where anybody can drop in and now they're counseling a lot of Gulf War vets. So there, there are resources out there outside of the VA as well in as remote a community as you can imagine where these people uh, help 
people who are trying to reintegrate into society. And you know, traditionally, I don't think we've done that formally. Suzanne documented that well in her book about how the VA works to reintegrate warriors back into civilian society because it's a, an enormous psychological impact on people and even as long as in Sparta that was done. So, you know, the, the younger vets can try the VFW and organizations like that. Okay, let's go to another question. Hi, thanks for, for coming here. My, I, my name is Mike Diedrich and I get my health care at the VA and I have to say that compared to my wife's health care through Kaiser, I get a better deal. Um, um, Every time I go to the VA, I, I, I'm treated with respect, and that's not all, always the case that I got when I was on my wife's plan. The other thing is that it's an important point, I think, is the uh, some of the panelists talked about the population, the projection of uh, projected population of veterans, and uh, compared to uh, Vietnam veterans, Gulf and uh, Gulf veterans, they have served equal to or or more so, so than the combat experience of Vietnam veterans, which was fairly extensive. Sir, do you, do you have a question? Yes, and, and, and let's comment on what some of the panelists said, and, and I'd like them to respond to this. The other thing is that the number of people who are have uh, toxic issues with recent wars, and also the number of, I talked to my osteo doc, and he says the, the, os, the arthritis prevalency among younger veterans is an epidemic. And the reason that is so is because they're carrying 100 pounds of gear almost all the time. And she says these people, according to this osteo doctor I talked to, they have the arthritis of a 70 year old. So these are problems that will go, go with them the rest of their lives in addition to the psychological problems. So I think that the- yeah, Okay, let's, get, let's let the panel uh, respond. Please. Thanks. Well, I think you're right. So, I mean, I think if you look at the uh, um, average person during the Vietnam War, they would go, they would serve a tour or two in Vietnam, and they'd be home. Uh, today, you know, the, I know the people in the Oregon National Guard, some of them have served six, seven tours uh, in the Middle East. Um, and we know, so we know that, that uh, service-connected conditions, related conditions, are going to be much higher, even though the numbers are much smaller, the service-connected conditions are going to be much higher in this population. And we definitely know that there's an exponential relationship between the time you spend in a combat zone and, and the um, development of PTSD. So I think this is going to be um, a huge problem for, uh, for the VA and for veterans in this country. And uh, Kelly said, you know, we, we actually contracted out a lot of services. So we have a lot of people and who were not in the military, not eligible for VA care, but who are citizens of this country who went over uh, and served. And they were paid well to do that. But they are going to come back with the same problems um, that our uh, military personnel have. And, uh, you know, I think private sector is even less prepared uh, mm -hmm. to serve that community of people. In the okay. Center up there. Did you still? Wait, I think we had a we had we yeah, had a first question in the back. Go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you for everything so far. Apart from the sort of anecdotal evidence of young veterans, you uh, how you did or didn't get to the VA. What do we know? What's our most current knowledge of the opinions among veterans? about the VA, both those who use it and those who don't. What data do we have about that, number one? And number two, what can we do collectively to combat the attempt to have people give up on the VA by underfunding it and understaffing it and so forth? What can we do to combat that? Okay. So there is actually a fair amount of data, and I, I can speak somewhat authoritatively as I was in charge of those data for about uh, eight years. So the VA administers surveys both in the outpatient and the inpatient uh, environments, which are identical, are 
very similar to uh, what's done in the private sector. And you can look those up. The VA puts them uh, up on Hospital Compare, and you can look at the, the CHAPS, the HCAPS, and the CAPS scores. To summarize briefly, actually, if you look at satisfaction with care, it's comparable across uh, systems. Um, the one actually interesting um, uh, area where VA lags behind is in the perceptions of access, which seems to run counter to the actual data. And I get, think that gets back to what people were saying is that, you know, there's been a, a lot of negative press about the VA. And actually, when Phoenix happened, uh, we saw satisfaction with care take a deep dip uh, almost immediately, which suggested to me that, you know, veterans were being influenced by what they were reading um, in, in, or listening to in the media. But the data suggests that veterans are highly um, content and satisfied with the care they get, just as most people are with their medical care outside the VA. I, I'll let someone else talk about how to sort of reverse that. I, I, I think Suzanne's right. It's something that um, in the VA, I think, um, like we've seen in the, in the media, it's, it's hard to fight back, really, as a governmental agency. And I think the VA largely is sort of, um, and, and maybe correctly, decided it, you know, it's got to be a punching bag because there's not much recourse. Well, the DOD certainly has a lot of <laughs> resources to promote its, its wars and so forth. Um, I mean, it has no problem with that, and it's a governmental agency. I mean, I agree, Steve, that, you know, the patient satisfaction scores are high, um, and also the surveys from veterans, I mean, VFW just did a recent survey. There's a whole bunch of surveys that show that veterans as a whole uh, don't want the VA privatized, but strengthened and improved. I mean, your question about how how can, how can it be stopped? It's a political issue, and it demands political will and political action. Veterans have to, uh, and veterans, and not just veterans, you know, families of veterans, and the people in this room who aren't veterans, and supporters of national health care. If we care about the VA, and, and I care about the VA because I believe, uh, you know, I have a, a, a bumper sticker on my car, I love my VA and save our VA. I'm not a veteran, uh, but I believe it is my VA. I pay for it in my taxes. Uh, I benefit from, you know, thank you for the shingles vaccine VA, you know, that I got. Um, I don't mm -hmm. have a pacemaker, but if I did need one, <laughs> I'd be grateful too. Um, um, and uh, we owe it to veterans. I mean, it's simple. You call, you know, we have staffers in this, in this uh, congressional staffers in this room. What do you do when you want to affect, you should answer that question. What do you do when you want to affect policy? You get on the phone. And you, and you make a phone call. It take, I do this routinely. It takes five minutes to call you know, your congressperson. You work with veterans groups. You, VFP, Veterans for Peace, is, is working all over the country. I mean, it's, a, it's no different than you know, getting the vote and abolishing slavery and getting a national health care system. You know, it's, it's not going to happen by ESP. We have to tell people uh, what we want. Um, I think it's very important to support Congress people and Senate senators who are voting the right way too. You know, we never call Bernie Sanders or Raul Grijalva or Nancy Pelosi to say thank you for voting against the Mission Act, which I think more people should have done. But I don't think it's a mystery how we get more funding, how we get changes in policies, how we get other than honorable discharge veterans covered. You know, you have to be active citizens in a okay. democracy. Okay. I would just right. like to add, I mean, I think it starts with leadership. Um, leadership within the VA. I mean, the average uh, undersecretary for health serves four years, um, and then it's replaced. There's no private sector company, forget healthcare, no private sector company that turns over a CEO every four years. Uh, it starts with political leadership. Um, you know, and I think that uh, the, the, the media and the VA get a lot of mileage out of uh, taking the VA apart. Um, and, uh, and rather than, I mean, I'll tell you, during the whole uh, Phoenix thing and with Choice, uh, I, was, I was front and center in all of that. Um, and it was, a, it was a political circus. Um, and it was, I, 
came away from that experience not believing that very many of the people that I sat and testified before were really interested in fixing the problems. Mm. I think they were more interested in the political mileage they got out of beating up the VA on C-SPAN. Mm. I honestly believe that. There were a few who really were, who would come down after the meeting, I'm not going to endorse any candidates, but uh, <laughs> you know, uh, would come down after the meetings um, and say, I know you're trying to do the right thing, what can I do to help you? But it was one or two people. Okay, we have time for one short question and maybe a short answer. Um, you mentioned families um, and families of veterans. Um, what sort of systems do you have in place to help um, caretakers who have veterans who have great complex issues such as being a paraplegic? And if that system is in place, how could it be improved? I couldn't hear your question, I'm sorry. Um, what sort of system do they have in place for family members who have, um, who have uh, veterans who have very complex issues such as being a paraplegic and if they do have that system, how could it be improved to support them? Well, the VA has, you know, long uh, been specialized in spinal cord injury. Um, you know, I, I think the expertise exists there, and I think many recognize the VA as a leader in that area. You know, in terms of capacity, I, I really can't say, and I think if eligibility were being expanded, that would be a big issue, is how would the VA expand its capacity to take care of both the sort of simple and chronic problems of family members. Well, one of the, the interesting things about the eligibility requirements in the VA is that there is, in prior to group four, uh, veterans who suffer a catastrophic injury who would, who would not be eligible. Well, she's talking about the family members. Right, but right. you know, if you're care, if you're, I mean, I know two veterans who were quadriplegics and who were not, who basically the meter ran out in private sector care for acute rehab, who would have been sent home and would have had been tremendous burdens on their family. And they ended up getting care in the VA. Uh, one of their family members is being paid to care for them. Um, another one got a whole lot better, so that took, uh, that took a, a huge burden off the family. And there is, under Mission Act, um, a, a, a program, and the VA has a program, for family caregivers to give them health insurance, training, and case management, and is there something else? And money, find, you know, a certain stipend. Um, it's not clear that there will be enough funding for it, uh, but it was only exclusively for post 9 11 veterans, and now it's been expanded to veterans of all eras. And that's another uh, uh, system that helps caregivers of very seriously injured veterans. I mean, Jim, you may know more about that than I do. But. Okay. Thank you for those questions. They're great questions. Um, thank you for responses, panelists. So I'm going to give the panelists uh, one last uh, uh, opportunity to say their piece about the discussion, their thoughts. We're going to start with Hugh. You've got two sentences. Sentences. And, you said yeah. two minutes. No, I said two sentences, oh, and goodness. and and I'm very hard on run-on sentences. Okay. <laughs> oh, commas. Um, I think the VA should be continued, maintained, improved, and adequately funded. I think the innovation and education that they have provided for generations of physicians in this country should not only continue but should be expanded as we face uh, health care provider manpower crunches that lie just over the horizon. Period. Good. <laughs> I, I'm going to play on top of Hugh's comment that we really haven't talked much about education and training. Mm -hmm. um, and. I would encourage you to look at your handouts for the statistics, but uh, privatizing the VA would be uh, an utter disaster for our medical schools and health professions trainings programs, and we just didn't get a chance to talk about that. 
For me, it comes down to which field do we till in? Like, which is the field that requires our effort and our energy and our problem solving? And for me, it's the VA field, that that's what needs to get our attention, that's what needs to get our efforts and our energies. Thank you. I think the VA is going to have to really reinvent itself uh, to continue to care for those who uh, bore the battle. And that's going to really take, I think, uh, tremendous leadership, uh, both politically and within the organization, to do that. Um, I clearly, obviously, favor continuing the VA and strengthening and improving it. Um, I think the VA is constantly transforming itself. I mean, if you look at women's health, 7% of VA patients are women, and they're creating an entire healthcare system for women. Um, I don't think you would see the private sector doing that. I don't think the private sector is equipped or particularly interested in handling the complex problems of veterans. So if we want to serve those who have borne the battle, I think we have to uh, strengthen, fund, staff the VA, and make sure that the private sector does have the appropriate kinds of partnerships and integration with the VA to serve the nation's veterans and all of us. Thank you. Okay, so <laughs> you can con congratulate yourselves in, in a second. So we're going to go back to that question, that matrix that you responded to at the beginning and <laughs> Do it again. See what, 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 where, where, where your thinking is at. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm the opposite of a data guy. Um, and so, I mean, uh, the, the center of gravity in, in the room has shifted. Now, a few people have left, so the sample population is no longer the same as we started. And uh, I actually have, you know, I'm not able to count, I don't know how many responses. There were 70 for the first one, and 51. Okay, 51 so far. But there you go. I'm not sure exactly what you conclude from that, but um, it's clearly been a great discussion. Let's thank our, our great panelists. And um, I want to uh, thank you all for, uh, for being here, for participating so, uh, so well. Um, there's an email. Do we have the email thing? Um, that's the go. And on a card. Um, if you have thoughts about um, this forum, I think there's, a, there's an email address. Oh, it's on this card. It's uh, uwchips.org. But I think, wasn't there an email address? Well, there's an email on the website. And if you have ideas for the forum for next year, please tell us what you think they are. Great. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Oh, survey. Oh, complete the survey before you leave, please.